Worldwide. Welcome to Misinformation, hosted by Rebecca Jones and produced by Big Mouth Media. This weekly podcast with Florida COVID whistleblower Rebecca Jones dives into the world of disinformation and how it's hurting America and democracy. Now, here she is, Misinformational. And we're off. Hello, everyone. Today, you know how, like, last week we had a lot of fun talking about, like, how the Irish secretly, like, control the banks and stuff? Well, today's not going to be fun, but it's, it's a discussion that needs to happen. I'm Rebecca Jones. You're joining us on Misinformational. Um, I am here with the always lovely Cindy, who is in Florida. How are the conditions in Florida right now, Cindy? Well, it's raining in November, in case you're wondering how climate change is going. Um, so I'm on actually at the FGCU campus where I, I work and it's almost the end of the semester. So actually all of our diligent students are, are taking up all the spaces in the library. So I'm sitting outside. Luckily the weather is uh, fairly pleasant, but, um, raining, which is very unusual for this time of year, but, um, I may be sweet, but I'm not sugar, so I'm not going to melt. <laughs> And of course, she looks gorgeous as always. I have now resigned myself to the fact that the the world is ending and I can't be expected to look cute while it happens. So I've given up um, if you're not watching, but you should watch because it's a, you know, added feature that you get for listening to us talk about issues all the time. And boy, description. Yes. We I've have... resigned myself to the fact that I'm going to wear like bright pink or bright red lipstick, even if the world is ending. Yeah, that's good for you. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I've done my, my share of having to look cute for the cameras. I'm, I'm done. My hair's a mess. I don't care. Um, we got some serious shit going on. So in the last 48 hours, there had been two opposing um, viewpoints coming to light on social media. Okay. The first I was planning to talk about more, but I'm going to do less so because of the urgency of the second was um, investigative reporting by Seth Aberson, who is a New York Times um, journalist, you know, best-selling writer, um, very good researcher who is excellent at disinformation analysis and journalism in general, um, published this massive report, and it will take you time to get through it, that essentially says that... Um, the death count from October 7th is nowhere near what Israel said it was. And it's not the result of, you know, normal estimates coming from conflicting reports or duplicate reports or anything like that. It was intentionally inflated from about 500 civilians killed that day to 1,400. But the actual mm -hmm. numbers closer to 500. Which... Uh, is disgusting. It was also strategic uh, because of, you know, the law of proportionality in the UN operations okay. and a whole lot of other things. And not that 500 civilians being murdered is not horrific and in itself, you know, okay. worthy of all of the attention it's gotten, but it was a very strategic lie along with all of the other lies. The New York, New York Times also finally came clean yesterday about the October 17th hospital bombing in which mm. they have now corrected their correction and stating very plainly, it was an Israeli rocket that hit that hospital and killed almost 500 people. So there was, you know, obviously this was almost a month ago, um, a hospital that was bombed in which I think over 500 people were killed. Mm -hmm. And it was first reported correctly that it was an Israeli missile or rocket or bomb. And then Israel's, celebrated it, took that down and saw kind of the backlash and was like, oh no, that was not us. They produced fake videos, um, even Photoshop right. pictures and all this other fabricated evidence to say it wasn't them, get it out of the press. I was uh, harassed quite a bit by very prominent people for saying mm -hmm. that, you know, you shouldn't trust the IDF on this. There's no substantiating evidence other than what they themselves have. Um, and now the New York Times a month later kind of just slipped it in there yesterday being like, we reviewed all the evidence. This was this was Israel. Israel bombed this hospital. Of course, that was like 100 hospital bombs ago. So nobody cares anymore. Right. Um, but it just goes to show how quickly these kinds of lies accumulate. And all of this is going to hurt, you know, 
Jewish people worldwide because Israel has done nothing but lie about everything. And even with people I know that I would not think of as being anti-Semitic, people I care about, have followed now this path of they lied about the hospital. They even lied about how many people died. They more than doubled it. What else are they lying about? It makes you think, wonder about the Holocaust. Somebody actually fucking said that to me yesterday. And I went, Yikes. oh, no, the fuck it doesn't. <laughs> I was like, first of all, the numbers of deaths from the Holocaust weren't coming from a designated Jewish nation. They were coming from independent investigators all across the world, from all different countries. I was like, right. no, no, no. This is exactly what the other side's propaganda wants you to think. Right. But there is now a legitimate question of what else right now are they lying about? And I can't post it because I was told that, you know, Sundance is currently reviewing all of their submissions and I don't want to be controversial. Um, but I am curious as to how we actually know how many hostages they have. Mm -hmm. Because they've cited different numbers, but every number that I could find from every news source that I found was citing the IDF. Mm -hmm. And the posters that are out there are of about 87 people that have had posters created for them. You know, the ones that are being controversial in their own right um, are being torn down and there's fights breaking out over it. And so it's it's very disgusting, and nasty. It makes you wonder if maybe that's why they're just carpet bombing Gaza. Is because maybe there aren't as many hostages as they said there were, or they already know where they are and want to bomb anyways, or whatever. But it's it's horrific that they've exploited the situation and what was a very real, still awful terrorist attack. But now mm -hmm. anybody that's gonna think about it, they're just gonna be like, Yeah, well, what was actually true in all that mess anyways? And that's right. sad. And not good. And is leading to the other thing that has been going extremely vile in the last two days. And it's not new. So for younger people, you know, who were born after 9-11, they never knew the world before it. I mean, even for a lot of millennials, you know, I think I was, what, I was in 2000s, I was 12 when that happened. We barely have a memory of the world because we were children. So we viewed the world as children of what the world was actually like before 9-11. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of propaganda that probably if Twitter was around back then would have been shared by Americans and celebrated that, you know, was bad for us. Mm -hmm. And um, in the last 48 hours, there have been thousands of influential people on TikTok and Twitter sharing Osama bin Laden's 2002 letter to the American people. It's about hmm. two pages translated, uh, less if you take out all the Islamic prayers and stuff. Um, and the responses of young people are being largely just dismissed. You're like, oh, what do you know? You weren't, you don't, you don't know anything about 9-11. You weren't even alive, blah, blah, blah. You're stupid. You're young. And that, that's not ever, ever an effective way of addressing something like this, but that is how it's being dealt with. Like everything else, oh. just blaming TikTok. Uh -huh. And I am trying to argue for a better way to confront why young people are sharing this, why it's having such an impact on them, and a way to talk to them that they will understand that it isn't condescending. Uh -huh. Because we are talking about a world before they existed, and it's hard to understand especially, you know, that he's been dead for you know, 12 years now, what he was yeah. about and why that letter was designed to do exactly what it's doing right now. And so I posted something to my sub stack that will cross pose about a way that I think is more effective to kind of talk about this and speak with young people or even people who are revisiting the letter or discovering for the first time that it existed because the themes that are in it, it's not a coincidence that it's popping up now. Um, mm -hmm. At the whole letter is asking essentially for two things. That the United States helped destroy Israel and Jews and that we all convert to Islam or die. And that is not the thing, <laughs> one of the things that young people are talking about from that letter. And that is the first sign that people are like, oh my God, he was a terrorist. It's like they're they're not being drawn to that. They can be read this letter and be dismissive of those ideas, assuming they get that far into it. Mm -hmm. What they are identifying with 
is the condemnation of American geopolitics, uh, political hypocrisy, you know, um, what they perceive as powerful entities silencing the will of the people. And those are universal bad ideas that progressives will oftentimes agree with. And it's, you know, right now we're, it's Palestine is a big part of it um, in the letter too. And so of course, this is why it's resurfacing. It's people were finally starting at least on one side to be able to separate the identities of Gazans with Hamas and mm -hmm. of, you know, the Netanyahu regime with Jews. This seeks to its release and its, its timing to kind of mm -hmm. blur those lines again. And it's incredibly effective for doing that. Huh. And uh, it, it's it's upsetting. I mean, I'm not like a whole like 9-11. I mean, like I said, I was 12 person. So I know it changed the world, but the tragedy of it all did not hit me the way that it would have if I was like 10 years older or 20 years older. That was but me. <laughs> I acknowledge running around telling everybody, oh yeah, guess what? America has not been the good guys all the time. And that was shocking to a lot of people. So, Well, yeah. And this is a tempting argument that a lot of people have kind of gravitated towards before all of the recent turmoil in the Middle East is that, you know, did the United States have it coming? You know, all of our meddling in the Middle East, you know, we've certainly gotten our hands very dirty and bloody and bin Laden points out all of this but mm -hmm. he does it in a way to kind of intrinsically tie basically every crime the United States has ever committed and almost to a larger extent every war that's ever occurred as being Jews carrying them out he's talking right. about like the dropping of the bombs in Japan and then tries to rope that back to being the fault of Israel and Jewish people and, mm -hmm. and so it's People are connecting these horrible things that the United States has done, legitimately done, reasons for legitimate critique, and trying to use that to connect it to, of course, this secret Jewish society that's controlling all things behind this magic curtain, um, which is, you know, he specifically says four different times that the Jews run the banks and the media. And so we recently did, again, a whole thing about how if you're going to blame anybody, any single ethnic group for controlling the banks, it's the Irish, not the Jews. The Irish. So people are believing that more and more and more. And that's yeah. disturbing. And we need to call that out as being false, not just anti-Semitic. We can't just blanketly say all of this is anti-Semitic. It is. But you're not right. making anyone understand why. And that's bad. Right. If you're watching, you get to see me not move, but you get to see Sydney. You know, she's still talking. So I keep fine. like rose. Yeah, beautiful and so I me. Okay. I think. All right, sorry. Want just wanted to check. out. Yeah, the logical fallacies of this argument. So, so Bin Laden scapegoating Jews for everything, every ill in the world. He blamed Jews more than he blamed America for the wars that we fought against Muslims. He blamed Jews more than he blamed the Russians that he fought in Afghanistan. I mean, he blamed a population of 12 million people for every war crime in the history of the world. And that is just doesn't hold water. You know, Americans are capable of doing atrocious, horrible things all by themselves. They don't need help to do it. And they're right. certainly not being controlled by anybody to do it. He flat out says that the creation of Israel is a crime and that it needs to be destroyed. Yep. And yeah, it, it's. It's very current. Because of what's happening Mm -hmm. and if we continue to fail to kind of rise up to the challenge of discussing these things, we're, it's going to get worse. And, and it's yeah. surprising that it could possibly get worse as far as public discourse around this issue without injecting Osama bin Laden into the mix. But the thing is, yeah, too, yeah. is that people need to remember that Osama bin Laden was smart and charismatic and oh. able to pull things that we kind of understand as you know, universal justice, you know, the plight of the disenfranchised or the oppressed. And as a man who was never a, you know, man of the people, the guy was rich. Well, most yes. people understand. 
which is yep. money that he inherited from his wealthy yep. family in Saudi Arabia. Um, he also pulls mm -hmm. in the fucking Kyoto Protocol and tries to blame us for polluting the world when his family owned the largest construction company in all of Saudi Arabia. So a lot of hypocritical bullshit in there too. Mm -hmm. You know, but he, there was a reason we was able to amass this terrorist organization. You know that, right. and now people are viewing him as you know, this rebellious fighter. He never intended to create a free democracy in the Middle East. He wanted control and power, right. and he ruled as you know an autocrat. Dissent was not allowed. Um, he never intended to create a democracy in which he could be removed from power. You know, mm -hmm. he was fighting to make the world into Sharia law. Right, a caliphate. Yeah, and so the ironic part is here is like, oh, they, he didn't hate our freedom. That's the main thing that people are sharing. And, that, and that's insane to me to come out and say, after having read this letter, you know, he did not hate our freedom. He didn't resent our freedom. Yet his ultimate demand is for us to surrender our freedom and convert to Sharia law or die. That is what he wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously that wasn't going to happen, but this was meant to sow discord and, and opposition to the war and didn't get nearly in the amount of circulation when he wrote it as it is right now, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But the, the arguments too that we need to hit within this that people are ignoring is that he makes the justification for 9-11 by saying that American people cannot be seen as innocent because... We are right. a democracy and we have the ability and choice to refuse the policies of our government and change them if we want. And again, a freedom he wants to give up. But because we have not done that, then we had it coming. Because it is our tax dollars that supply the weapons, we as individuals are legitimate targets. And then he said, this is why the American people cannot be innocent of all the crimes committed by the Americans and Jews against us. By the way, that's the same argument I've been hearing for the pro IDF folks. Exactly. From the pro IDF folks. Exactly. All right, I don't know if you were going to get there. Exactly. I was like, oh, I've heard this argument. Yes. So supporters of Israel have been using the 2006 elections in Gaza as proof that Gazans support Hamas, you know, uniformly right. and are therefore condemned to the same fate as the soldiers in Hamas even though no elections have been held since then. And most of the people who are alive in Gaza today did not vote for Hamas. But yet that is what right. the IDF is saying is like, if they really wanted to, they could expel Hamas. They could take over the power. They could do all these things and they're not. So they're guilty and they deserve to die. And those, the people who disagree with that by and large are the same people who are saying now that, you know, Israel is wrong for that. But they're defending Osama bin Laden's viewpoint, which is the exact same thing. You are guilty right. for the actions of your leaders, which completely overlooks the fact that half the time our leaders don't fucking listen to us. You know, we right. have widespread, almost, and this very rarely happens, um, ma overwhelming majority support for a number of issues that Congress never acts on, like gun control is overwhelmingly supported by Martian. the majority that we never do anything. 90% um, of Americans support age and term limits for Congress. It's never going to happen. You know, American politics is not as simple as one vote, one, you know, voice. It's, it's much more complicated than that. And I've never right. voted for any of these wars and I would never have voted for any of these wars and I shouldn't have to die because I was ignored. But that goes right. to the next question. Like, ask these people, do you agree that thousands of children in Gaza should die because of an election held before any of them were born? And do you feel right. that you, as an American, are a legitimate target because you were born here, you work here, you live here, or that your family's fair game to be murdered because you have the right to vote, or that you right. should die just for being an American? Because those right. are the same fucking arguments. And yep. I, th I think one of the most important things, and because a lot of this is coming from women, which is bizarre, is to remind them that bin Laden was a religious fundamentalist and fanatic who practiced one of the most extreme and conservative views of Sharia law. And his literal first demand was that we all convert to Islam or die. And that we stop making laws as he says we desire. He's asking us to throw out our government with the freedom that we have, to surrender the freedom we have, 
to enact a law that imprisons most of us. And um, he also demanded a whole lot of other things that are not popular with young people that we should point out, like banning all intoxicants, including drugs and alcohol. Um, he demanded that we ban gambling and pretty much everything that the far right in America now wants to do, Bin Laden was way more extreme on. He demanded that women submit to men, that we cover our bodies, our faces, our hair, lest we lose our modesty and be put to death. You know, that education should be restricted to men, that there would be no women in government, no women in media, basically no women visible anywhere ever. He demanded that we stop all acts of, you know, immorality, which ranged from oral sex to homosexuality, that we ban art and entertainment, um, ban dissent. And because he's a religious fundamentalist, he believes the punishment for these crimes is death. Mm -hmm. And so all of these women who are, expressing themselves that you know on tiktok of how it changed their view yeah it's okay to examine the historical context of it, of extreme events in the past but you also need to recognize that the person that you're heralding as some kind of champion for unwanted truths or inconvenient truths also would kill you himself and feel nothing doing it because you're a woman who is speaking right yeah it's weird because actually i was listening to NPR about Mike Johnson this morning. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, wow. So Christian nationalists in the United States have a lot of parallels with far right or, you know, extremist Islamic fundamentalist movements that we had been fighting under the guise of terrorism for decades. And we have our own version. It just happens to be Christian instead of Islam. And um, so pointing out those parallels is interesting as well because they're, they're the actions are quite similar. The silencing of women and the the patriarchal structure is the same, and and it's all coming back to a few figures of strong men. And I think if I can tie this together for everybody, it's when you have extreme stress in a society, you have upheaval, and if you think of what had happened in the Middle East in the late 90s, you know, you had, you know, wars and things like that that were happening over there. These types of figures become very attractive. Authoritarianism becomes very attractive because it feels stabilizing, right? So people are actually willing to give up their freedoms for the feeling of security and stability. And that plays out in research, actually, on how people vote. So the, the more fearful people are, the more likely they are to uh, vote for candidates that have authoritarian signs. And so I think that that's why we're seeing this kind of uptick in desirability for candidates like Donald Trump in the United States um, and a swing of authoritarianism around the world. And we can attribute it globally, at least right now, to things like COVID and economic instability, as well as climate change. Yeah. And, you know, it goes to this deeper discussion of the justification of violence and rebellion. And I think that is the theme that most people are taking away from it is, is that sometimes violence is necessary to rebel. That is something that obviously Donald Trump has embraced. Um, I mean, that's what happened on January 6th. But, you know, Bin Laden was not Luke Skywalker or V. You know, and, and rebellions that are bloody often take decades to recover from. Probably the only one that actually had purpose that I can think of that might resonate with some people who are sharing this is the French Revolution. You know, we're, we're talking, the death toll there was absolutely insane and it did instill a democracy, but it took a long time. And Bin Laden was no freedom, freedom fighter on the fringes of a battle between good and evil. He was evil. He was a, a violent person who wanted to do bad things. This is not violence for good. Violence for good would be, you know, if the people at Standing Rock had fought back against police that were spraying them with, you know, hoses, fire hoses off of a bridge in the middle of February, you know, right. and, and even then we would have condemned that universally as, oh, well, it shouldn't be violent, even though violence was being carried out against them. Right. And what did we do when Native Americans tried to rebel violently? We just killed them all. You know, and it, right. this idea, idea that violence is necessary, I don't wholly disagree with. Mm -hmm. And there are some of those themes that, you know, people in Gaza, 
individuals might take up arms to defend themselves if they see Israeli forces coming to their house to kill them. And that is an act of violent rebellion. But traveling across to another country to inflict terror is not the same thing as yeah. acting out against an oppressive regime. And they're not making that connection or that parallel. Yeah. And I mean, this this is an effective argument. There's a reason why he was able to do all of the things he did, in addition to his obscene wealth and political connections. And yeah. it's because it's convincing. It and is like convincing. All tyrants, he's using religion and exploiting it to tap into people's faith, their naivety, their suffering, and use it right. to direct violence towards people that, you know, we were how many thousands of miles away. He didn't lead people to, you know, take over parts of the Middle East that he thought were suffering. He didn't use his money and resources to free Palestine from Israel. He used it to attack American commerce and American democratic processes. That's what he did. If all of his right. plight was really about freeing the Palestinians with his money, resources, and army, he could have marched to Palestine and, you know, freed every person there, however he saw fit. And he chose not to because it wasn't about that. Because without that right. suffering, he has no standing to amass the forces that he wants to cause and inflict terror and to lead as an example of the champion for Sharia law worldwide. Yeah. And I think it's worth pointing out that the way that he recruited folks, and I, and I say this too, because this is one of the reasons why my early career was in international development and inter international relations is because there was a high linkage to poverty and suffering and the ability to recruit terrorists. So if your country has a high level of exploitation, you have a low level of you know, capacity to have a good livelihood, high levels of abject poverty, you're more likely to have portions of your population that are recruited into these terrorist type of organizations. And it's because there's not a lot else to do. And Osama bin Laden would go into these areas and his recruits would go into these areas and tell people, you are going to be a martyr. You're going to be a suicide bomber. Uh, you're going to go and you're going to get whatever. I can't remember. It's 19 virgins or something like this. Uh, once you enter the gates of heaven, because you're you're doing Allah's work. And uh, this will take you out of the suffering of being in this poor place. And you're going to be serving your people, right? So he was convincing people to not only just join his cause, but to kill themselves in the process for it. And they were able to do that because they were in a vulnerable position. So I actually took that as my calling in my life to commit myself to helping people escape poverty. And that's what I did for a large portion of my early career. I was working in international development. I was researching, I was studying, I was helping communities empower themselves so that they would not be at the whim of somebody like Osama bin Laden. So I guess that there's my formative moment coming out of 9-11 was that is like, I said, no, this is terrible and we should not allow these ostensibly wealthy, wealthy hucksters to convince people um, to kill themselves for glory in the afterlife for their own political purposes and, um, you know, to the death and demise of their family. I mean, it was, it, you know, it was moving to me in that realm, but I think it's important for people to realize that that's, that's, that was a huge part of it. And um, we didn't, we saw it in the United States on 9-11, but the Middle East itself had seen this as, for a very long time. And this is part of a whole nother Islamic battle between the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Wahhabists in Saudi Arabia for different control of different parts of the region. It was just easy to galvanize people around hating Israel and hating the United States. Yeah. And it's, this is more targeted for this. I don't think they're even trying to motivate people to hate the United States. That's not why this is resurfacing right now in the context that it's being framed. It's got a dual purpose. It's for one to further divide Americans on not supporting Israel, which, I mean, there has never been a more rapid change in worldview towards that nation in its history, in its very short history, than there is right now. Um, I do not support what Israel is doing. I've been very open about that. I've been threatened not to do that. I've, somebody said, you know, if if you keep speaking out against Israel, they're going to cancel your movie. They're going to cancel your book. They're going to ruin your life. And I was like, it's kind of anti-Semitic to just assume that all of the Jews are controlling Hollywood and, you know, publishing and everywhere else. So I'm just going to ignore that and do it, continue to tell the truth and do what I think is right. But there is some level of fear to it when you have somebody in the media tell you that. Um, okay. They want to turn people against Jewish people everywhere. 
Right. And okay. in America, it's really not helpful that so many people are conflating Judaism and Israel. And anytime you say anything against Netanyahu or the IDF or its many, many provable lies, you're just labeled as an anti-Semitic. And right. that is, you know, the shouting down thing. It's like you're not even listening and so when something like this comes up, something that people are seeing as having been buried, you know, the Guardian made the huge fucking mistake of removing their translation of it immediately, which only reinforces this idea that the, you know, end quote powers that be don't want There's you to read it. There's something to hide. Yeah. Yes. Um, that was a huge fucking mistake. You can still read it. It's the internet. It's everywhere. Um, you know, we have to actually listen to what it is that they're connecting with. Yeah. And why they feel like they're being silenced. And, you know, it's not that you have to remind people, are you supporting Gazans, not Hamas, because you believe that the suffering of innocent people because of what their political leaders do is wrong? And if you are, why on earth are you using an example of one of the people who did exactly that as your justification for it? It's just you can't side with bin laden you know it, it's just interesting and not israel because they're using like the, the same fucking argument and that sounds i'm probably gonna get shit for saying that but they are using the same argument i am it is the same argument for the fact that you know george bush senior who i was born while he was president you know led all of these gulf wars and you know i'm responsible for ronald reagan when my mom was like 10 years old when he got elected you know it's and I should die because of that. And no one, none right. of these people are going to agree to that. And so if you, they're naturally drawn to the, the suffering, to defending the suffering and those who have no voice. And so if you remind them that the people that Osama bin Laden actually killed were not the president, you know, were not the senators, that he didn't take his wealth and his resources to go help Palestine. He did it to make a name for himself and to be a global symbol as a martyr so that he can make money. Right. then they'll be able to separate that. And I think when I wrap this up, that's the TikTok I'm going to be like. It's like, you think that he was really on the side of Palestinians? you have any idea how much wealth he had? You, we all right. know that Saudi Arabia is rich as fuck. Now imagine the largest construction company in the entirety of Saudi Arabia during their construction revitalization and boom and not giving one fucking cent to the people in Gaza. Right. You know? And so I think we need to reframe him as a symbol of the elite and status and right. of exploitation. Because yeah. they're not seeing him as that right now. Yeah. I mean, well, people don't see that in Donald Trump either, do they? Yeah. Uh, he sounds stupid, though. So it's <laughs> it's easier for you know people to think he talks like me. You you will hear that from Donald Trump people. He says it like it is. You know, he, he speaks like me. That resonates with people. Even this letter well, is a pretentious retelling of history through the views of you know, his very privileged advantage point. So you can use that more because he did not write like an idiot. He didn't speak like an idiot. Yeah, but I think it was also like he, it was a different time too when Bin Laden was there. So he made himself to look like the people, like especially when he was engaging in these like high level terrorism type of things. Like, he was a poser. Call him out for being a fucking poser. He was he, a like, fucking he was poser. Good. He was in these like shady ass basements when he was actually in a mansion in Palestine the entire, I mean, not Palestine, Pakistan right. the entire yeah. time. Right. Um, living, you know, in this huge complex with, you know, flat right. screen TVs and everything else yeah. while all of his people and he were would, suffering. He would wear the clothes of like the common person as well. He pretended to be a, a regular person because he knew that he wasn't and he had to be seen as such like exactly. all of those things we need to be hitting hard to respond to this because it is very concerning that it's out there i don't give a shit people read the letter i think you should we should you know not blind ourselves to the propaganda that's led us into like a 20-year war you know so it's it's okay yeah. to read it but the way that people are reacting to it and you know that's kind of reflective of how people have reacted to any criticism of israel is only making it worse. Yeah, it's like for God's sake, please, please don't choose Osama bin Laden as your your poster child for for anything at all. Like I just, it's a very strange time, I guess, to be talking about these types of things. Because honestly, I saw it trending, and I didn't even know what was going on, Rebecca. Because I yeah. I'm over here teaching, and I just went on my merry way, and here you're telling me like everybody's reading Osama bin Laden's letter and they're jiving with it and uh uh that's uh that's pretty it's 
pretty surprising for me. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, I think I have to hit on those themes in my own TikTok since I have kind of a platform there as well and be like, you know, with all of his wealth, he never helped his own people. He never helped the people of Palestine. Right. You know, he put on costumes to pretend like he was one of the normal people. He totally did the Mitt Romney jeans, you know, move to, to pose and pretend to be something that he wasn't because nobody would believe him if they saw him as the rich, you know, what is right. it called? Um, Nepo baby that he was. And uh, yeah, we, Osama was a Nepo baby. Oh, we need to. It's a Nepo baby. Bin Laden was a Nepo baby. We need to like get that trending. That's going to be our title, I think. <laughs> okay. Let's see if we can get it. But they're seeing ideals that they connect with. And that, that's how the shit works. It's like that is how every cult leader or every terrorist gets people to follow them. They speak something that, you know, hits a, a nerve with us, the suffering of innocent people, you know, the destruction of culture, right. all these other themes, and then turns it into, and it's all the Jews' fault. And if you're already susceptible to these arguments, in right now there's a war involving, you know, a self-proclaimed Jewish state, it's hard not to separate those things. And so it's right. – very fucking careful i i don't care if i get called a zionist again today i'll be a hamas lover tomorrow it, it changes every other day but this is sick and, and enraging and it's from a lack of information or context and we can fix that i i've um i've been struck recently about how recurring these themes have been i guess too um you and I talked a little bit offline about this, but I'm I'm reading Rachel Maddow's new book, and she's talking about basically about how there was a, a really substantial Nazi movement in the United States prior to World War II, and oh yeah, and during actually, World War II, right, and and that there was actual German funding and dollars coming into the United States, and and what this looked like, and um, I guess I just never really thought about it, but she's kind of playing it up as to like this is like we're we're just like repeating the same thing over and over and so a lot of the tropes that we've heard are the very same ones from there and she's talked about you know uh henry ford who's well celebrated in the united states who was known anti-semite you know uh bit uh not been laden we're talking about different guys. hitler had a portrait of uh hit of Henry Ford on his wall because he thought that the fact that he had a newspaper that celebrated was anti-Semitic and was pushing that propaganda in the United States was a really great thing. And um, we just, we came to see, keep seem to recycle these tropes and they get recycled because it's convenient for people to use them to gain power. Right. Um, and it gets people going because scapegoating is so popular as well. And yes. another component of that, that is like hitting home to me as well is how much closer we are getting to also that, uh, that war of civilizations po uh, posits that had been kind of around and everybody um you know it was supposed to be the next big world war was going to be this culture war between christianity and islam and there's a lot of these uh, you know cultural components of that that are that are starting to play out so there's pundits that are talking about that as well yeah and um if you're hearing my daughter singing in the background she was supposedly sick again and had to stay home today so that that's what she's doing although she seems to be fine now but yeah i'm i think i'm gonna try several different themes on this tiktok because frankly we should all be trying to combat this kind of thing and to make people understand how you know suffering is very oftentimes exploited by bad actors um, all of the time uh, in every country in the history of the world. And that if you want to find, you know, some intellectual voice ag against American imperialism, even within the Middle East, Bin Laden's nowhere near the top of that list, even if you're right. going for ones that justify violence. And so, you know, it's just to understand his character, destroy his character. And I think that we'll get further with this and accept, you know, acknowledge the truth of what he's saying as far as suffering goes and make sure that people understand that he is not the, the um, the, uh, crusader That's savior. Yeah. yeah. For people, then we can try to stop this because this is going to inflame anti-Semitism to an even worse degree than it already is. And it's, it's getting very dangerous. People are dying in this yeah, country literally. People are being attacked and dying. So I wouldn't ordinarily ask for us to end early, but the rain has actually started quite a lot right now. <laughs> so 
I'm wondering yes, if and you there's could a go very ahead long post about this as well that we have so you can read through it. Um, I'm going to be pushing out some TikToks very soon because, you know, that's part of my job is try to destroy this kind of disinformation. And it's raining on you and I can see your hair is getting wet. So <laughs> with that, um, we will see you guys next week. And if Cindy wants to close it out, go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing this information with us on Misinformational. And I've been your co-host, Dr. Cindy Banier, outside of FGCU in the rain. And if you want to help keep us dry in future episodes, we'd love to have your support. Go to the plans and pricing page on Big Mouth Media at BigMouthMediaFL.com and get yourself a subscription. And thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. All right. I'm running. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.